This episode of the Yes to World podcast is in part sponsored by all of my amazing patrons. And if you want to help support the making of future content, please check out my Patreon and shop in the description below. And if you enjoy the video, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Hello everybody, welcome to the Yes to World podcast. Today with us we have a very special guest, Kevin from Defunct Land. How's it going, Kevin? It's going good, Mark. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. I, I know it it took long, longer than it should have to finally get you on here, but I'm glad you're here. It only took me calling you out on Twitter every time you posted someone else was on the podcast of just being like, really? You know, I know. Even when Dan, the, like Dan had two episodes. It's like Disney Dan's been on twice and I haven't even been on once. It's come on. Yeah, especially <laughs> with uh, the Toy Story thing or um, with Pixar Pier. Because you were like, no, I've actually been there. No, Pixar Pier. I was like, I've actually been there. Dan hasn't even been there, and he's talking about it. And so yeah, that was that was the end. But you you convinced me to come back, to come on, I guess, not come back, because you've never <laughs> had me before. I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> no worries. The <laughs> first of many, hopefully. Um, Absolutely. So the first thing I thought we could talk about, um, something I'm interested in, and I know everyone else probably is, um, so you have a book coming out in the very near future called The Funkland Guide to the Magic Kingdom. And I thought you could talk a little bit about what inspired you to create this book in the first place. Money. No, I'm just kidding. Um, motivator of everything. <laughs> not money, because there's a lot easier ways to make money than self-publishing, as I've, as I've recently learned. Um, but the uh, no, my, my real reason for writing the book was because I, you know, I... I take it down to, you know, three uh, main reasons. Um, so I decided to create the book after, out of a suggestion by someone else. They essentially asked me mm-hmm. uh, that, well, they, well, they suggested really that I should make a coffee table book um, be, uh, with the funk land and have a bunch of pic- giant pictures of old rides. And I thought that was a great idea, but mm-hmm. it's just not doable because of copyright. You know, that's in no way could I spin that as fair use. Right. Um, in no way, like if I was literally just publishing pictures of old rides, that is in very much in violation um, of everything. So I decided, well, maybe I don't do a coffee table book, but I do kind of a, a multimedia-esque um, book that's a guide. Um, and so then I started thinking, well, I want to, I want to, you know, spoof or parody the unofficial guide um, to Disney World, which is Lentesta's book. But I mean, of course, there's so many other guides that do the same thing. So it's kind of a spoof of all of these Disney World, how to do your tip trip guides. And I decided on the Magic Kingdom because it's the most visited park and because I felt like that was the easiest to tackle in terms of history. Um, and also really gave me the opportunity. And the main reason I decided to write it is because I can now focus on some of the smaller attractions, right. like the Walt Disney Story, like the Penny Arcade, you know, even down to, um, I mean, I could do videos on uh, Enchanted Tiki Room under new management, but you know, I mean, I just those kind of smaller experiences, Stitch's Supersonic Celebration, that show, um, that I find super interesting, but only work. In, but you wouldn't do a yeah. video on them necessarily, right? Because there's just not that much there. There's probably right. not even four minutes um, in a lot of these. Right. So just to be able to talk about those is just very, um, it's it's fun, um, yeah. and it's something I want to do. Especially, I wanted to get. The whole park. I wanted. I wanted to take you around, and I wanted to show you everything um, that used to be there. Um, as as much other than you know, as I say in the book, parades and restaurants because there's mm-hmm. too many to count. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of my goal. I just wanted to be able to create a completionist extinct historians guide. I wasn't concerned with you know, um, you know, pointing out every hidden Mickey. I wasn't concerned with telling you every little fun fact. I was just concerned of telling you what used to be in every specific location. Because one thing in reading the book, I thought one thing I thought that you balanced really well, because I wasn't quite sure what to expect going in. It was like, okay, is it going to be more satire? Is it going to be more of a literal guidebook? Is it going to be more fictional? And I like that you really did a great job of balancing everything, where if you've never been to the Magic Kingdom, it's a great guide to help you plan your day, to... Um, know where to start and just a, you know, just a good way to introduce you to the park and how to maybe plan out your day. But it's also good for people that are familiar with the parks because you have a lot of history and a lot of aspects that maybe they didn't know about. And I know for me personally, I like it when I'm reading, you know, because we, 
you know, our job is to know as much about these rides that we cover as possible. So I love it when I get to learn something new about an attraction or whatever. And I even found myself a few times being like, oh, I did not know that. <laughs> and so I, I like that you were able to balance the book to uh, be accessible by different audiences and not just theme park fans, not just people who have never been, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad that that came out and worked because it was, you know, another part of me was like, if I'm going to write a book, then I need to make it with me. Yeah, I need to be right. in it. So, I mean, it's me throughout. It's not a, it does not read like a textbook um, at all. It's, it's, I'm very present. Um, Kevin, me, Kevin is very present throughout the right. book and I'm very uh, aggressive and I'm very uh, uh, sarcastic and I'm, uh, I, I really have strong opinions right. on everything that but, I do. But you kept it managed. You know, you, there's nothing that I read that I was like, that I can imagine anyone being furious over, you know, or, you know, cause some people get really riled up, but it had a very good balance of not pushing it too far, but still incorporating your opinions and, but not in Maybe like the a, whip. yeah, that's, that was the main <laughs> one that I was like, how dare he? <laughs> Yeah, and you know, but it was, and it was just the reason to include myself so much is because well, one, I can't help it, and also just because I, as a internet Disney theme park um, Universal historian, I don't have that much to offer in terms of strictly knowledge. I mean, all of my, all the only reason Defunct Land is successful or is watchable is not because I can go do research better than everyone else because there are other people out there that do much more meticulous research than me. Allison from Walt Dated World, who is my fact checker for this book, has done so much more meticulous research. I mean, I'm not bad at research, don't get me wrong. I do my research, and I, and I try to find new and interesting angles and put the story together. But, I mean, there's so many people that do that. Well, you, you know, the you don't have the luxury, I don't think. Or I think when um, there's a difference between having – like if you just write articles as a hobby or you publish yeah. every couple months, you have all that time to explore every nook and cranny of a particular subject um, versus when you're trying to get a video out every two weeks or mm -hmm. whatever. And, you know, it's not that we don't do an insane amount of research because I know I do and I know you do. Um, you you kind of have to find a balance, I think. But I imagine for a book... Um, you just have a little bit more, like I said, luxury that you don't have with online content creation. Right. And so when I was thinking through this through, I was like, okay, I'm not the, I'm not the end all be all Disney historian. I'm not, I'm not even, you know, up into the ranks of the Jim Hills who that just are just so knowledgeable. You can just ask him anything and he knows about it. He knows the, a story you've never heard about it because right. he's just been there and done that. Um, so what I have to do is I have to put me in it. I have to put my personality, my style, which is what, you know, I think some people come back for on Defunct Land. Um, is that I just have to put that in there and it has to be present. If not, I'm. it's very pompous of me to think, well, yeah, you've heard the history of Walt Disney World, but have you heard it? Have you heard the history that I am going to write? Like, right. You know, I, ha I have to add so much of that commentary and humor in order to just make it worth writing and reading. Right, because you either, ha I think when you approach those kind of books, not that I've written one, but I would assume, you know, it's either A, you have to do something that has never been or very little um, that's never been covered or has been covered very, very little. Or if it is something like the Magic Kingdom where there's a um, bajillion guides out there, you have to bring your personality, your sense of humor, your um, opinions, you know, into it. And then it becomes um, unique. You know, it isn't just like every other um, guide out there because there's so many of them. There's so many guides to... All the different yeah, parts. there's. I mean, just go on Amazon. There's, there's thousands. I'm sure. Um, so, so in choosing Magic Kingdom over Disneyland, was that more because you thought, um, like, the history and lore of Disneyland would be harder to contain in a guidebook, or that just Magic Kingdom the research would be a little easier or less covered? Um, well, one reason is because it, Disney World is the most visited theme park. Well, I mean, Magic Kingdom, Walt Disney right. World's Magic Kingdom is the most visited theme park in the world. So it just felt like the jumping off point 
too. I mean, Disneyland isn't even the most recognizable mm. anymore. If you showed, you know, anyone pretty much under the age of 30, I would say, a uh, a picture of right. Sleeping Beauty Castle and a picture of Cinderella Castle and like say, you know, which one do you recognize or which one do you th- which one is the real one, you know, mm-hmm. something like that. Um, they would point to Cinderella Castle. Just the image of Magic Kingdom is so much more prevalent and strong compared to Disneyland. Um, for the vast majority of the United States, California, you probably never even heard of Walt Disney World. <laughs> it's a resort in Orlando, Florida. Anyways. No, it's um, interesting because, but, like, for me, I grew up going to Disneyland, like, every year, every other year. So in my mind, I always just thought, oh, Disneyland's the most popular place and it's my favorite place and I only went to Disney World once when I was like 12 uh, in my childhood at least so I always just found it surprising I guess that Magic Kingdom is more visited than Disneyland but it makes total sense when you actually you know look at the reasons why right yeah because uh, Brazilians love Magic Kingdom more than they the Mexicans love Disneyland apparently um, but anyways uh I just find that so interesting. So do you think, I mean, I know it was for a time, but like today, if there was just Magic Kingdom in Florida and just Disneyland in California, and, you know, there wasn't Epcot, Hollywood Studios, Animal Kingdom, um, and all that, do you think Magic Kingdom would still be the more popular of the two? Or does all the stuff that is in Disney World have a play a major factor in that? Um, I'm, that's hard to say. I think it would. I think it would um, be more popular, probably. Um, I, just because if if you keep the resort aspect, it would be more popular. Um, if you if you did if you said which one if you just placed you know Magic Kingdom by itself in the middle of three highways like Disneyland is. Um, I just think Disneyland is never going to be looked at as a vacation destination mm-hmm. as much as they they're trying to make it to. It's not relaxing. There's it's just not. They have nice hotels, um, but it's there's never a relaxing time at Disneyland. It could be a you know it could it could get it could be it could give you the feeling of relaxation, but it will never. That's never the purpose it will serve. I don't think so. Just the fact that Magic Kingdom is so secluded, it's such a destination. Um, it's so much. Not more magical, but so much m- more of an experience to go to for the vast majority of people. When you know, if you look at Disneyland's attendance numbers, how many of them are just Californians um, versus Magic Kingdom, which draws in so much more, even on an international scale, like I was mentioning earlier with Brazil, um, and you know, of course, the rest of the world too. Um, it's just, it's it's hard to say, but I I don't know. I think Magic Kingdom, it, it's just a a situation. Where Disneyland also has to, I think Disneyland, I mean, if you look at it historically, it's always had that, how do we up crowds? How do we get more people in here? That was a huge issue with Eisner in the 80s and 90s. You know, right. we gotta, let's get Star Wars, let's get Indiana Jones. We have to get, let's do the Muppets. Like, whatever we can do to try to get more people here. Um, and then uh, Disney World, Walt Disney World now, is like, how do we get people to stop coming here? <laughs> it's so crowded. Yeah. Uh, we're at capacity every day, <laughs> and so uh, it's it's just it's just the difference between the two. It yeah. doesn't mean that you know one's better than the other. Um, right. Disneyland yeah. and California Adventure are the two most fleshed out Disney parks in the United States. I would say, um, even California Adventure has right. you know, improved so much oh, with wow. the amount of yeah. attractions it has. It's a night and day uh, difference. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's a it's a. It's a puzzle piece of a park. Or it's, it's just band aids, but the band aids are really nice. Like right. Cars Land is such a like band aid here, band aid like you know. Uh. Well, you know it's funny because you know I did a a podcast with TPM, and uh, me putting verses in the title probably didn't help, but from us talking about what we liked about Magic or what we preferred in Disneyland over Magic Kingdom, um, people just got really really upset. And maybe I should have probably been more clear about this, but I think there are pros and cons to both Magic Kingdom and Disneyland. Um, There are aspects of one or the other that I prefer. There's no, in my opinion, one isn't better, you know, than the other. And, And I think it really just depends on your personal preference. You know, like I said, I grew up going there every year 
And it's, so it's like embedded in my childhood. It's, I mean, it's where so many of my like fondest memories are. And I mean, like I remember going uh, the year that Indiana Jones uh, Temple of the Forbidden Eye opened um, and it was insane. I was really upset because I was too short to write it. <laughs> but so to me, having grown up with Disneyland and that's where my obsession began, um, well, I guess more like an interest that turned into an obsession uh, began with Disneyland. But I imagine if you grew up going to Disney World, you would have like how I feel about Disneyland with Disney World, you know, and, and that makes total sense. Yeah, it's just if you can if you can look at it honestly and you'll you'll see the, the differences between a Disney a Disneyland and the Magic you'll see I mean the Magic Kingdom of course well is not as fleshed out and um, I and I, every time I bring up an attraction in the book I I you know go back and forth and say well Disneyland has this and the Magic Kingdom has this and the reason I do that is because I can't tell the history of a lot of Magic Kingdom's rides without mentioning Disneyland because Disneyland is where they came from um, but but it's special when there is one that isn't found at Disneyland. Um, but the you know Walt Disney World also has as a resort it has the ability to have way more original attractions than Disney and California Adventure combined. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't even know if that's that number is correct, but I'd imagine it is, considering they have three. Well, they have more space. They have three parks, three other you know parks. When Disney Disneyland only has one, um, and those those parks all serve a very specific purpose. And so like Disney, I mean, Disneyland has its pros. Disney World, Walt Disney World has its pros. Um, Disneyland's a better park, of course, but, um, just as far as, I mean, back to the book, Magic Kingdom just was a really, I mean, it just, it just made the most sense to me to right. write, write, tackle that one yeah, first. And, you know, one thing I was going to say is that, you know, I don't get offended very easily, but there was a part of the book where you have a line about uh, a character named Mark not finishing his turkey leg. <laughs> and, I, and I was just so offended that you would imply that I would not finish a turkey leg. <laughs> I think I did put that name because when I all the names in the book are of course meaningless. But I think when I was putting that in I was thinking like what what name should I put? And then I was like, well Mark's from, Mark from Yesterworld. World. So I think I did have you in mind when I wrote that. I don't think funny. the meaning behind it. But <laughs> no, the, the, I, I don't I Well the the funny thing actually about it was that and I know it's blasphemy to say it, but I'm not really a, a fan of turkey legs personally. I just uh, which I thought was funny because I've never told you that, and I thought, well, how do you know that? <laughs> there, maybe it's because there's just too not much. something that you can. It's too much. Yes, it's on not... a hot day. And... It's too much salt. Right. It's just hard for oh me to get gosh. through. Um, it's never an item to me that, like, it's it seems like false advertising because it's never something that you can just bite into, like right. a medieval king. It's something you have to like. Watch out for those not bones, but really thick. Like, anyways, oh, yeah, that's what you. Those things will, you know, it's like yeah, dangerous it's to, weird. to eat. But I thought that was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> you know, one part of the book I thought was interesting that I didn't know about is that you mentioned there was like a, a stitch show in Tomorrowland that actually referenced Alien Encounter. And I thought that was so, um, what's the word? tragic irony um that you know stitch would end up replacing alien encounter well that's a, well i should say that that's actually you gotta reverse those because the stitch show came in 2009 i believe and so it was already after alien encounter which is worse because stitch had murdered alien encounter and then referenced it in his own stage show oh so i had it backwards oh that's that's even more brutal um yeah there was even uh Another e Easter egg, I guess you could say, on the People Mover that referenced Alien Encounter, and there was even another in Space Mountain, I believe. Yeah, the uh, yeah, there's, I think that's still there, maybe. Um, I it's just very all the all those little references I I think are really cool. Um, and then it, it's it's cooler to have a reference to an old attraction. Actually, no, I should take that back. Um, I think it's cooler to have a remnant mm, of an yes. older attraction rather than a reference. Because a reference is never as interesting to me as a remnant. So, like, a good example is um, to see when you're on the People Mover, and I do this every time I'm on that People Mover now, is to see the blacked out windows mm. of what used to be if you had wings um, and then Delta Dreamflight, and to see those windows where you'd be like, if that piece of whatever cardboard or wood wasn't there, we could see into 
um, you know, Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger right. spin. And when you're going through Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger spin to try to look up and find those, and then you'll realize where the people mover is. But, of course, you're too focused on blasting at that point. <laughs> yeah, and they have, like, a there's a similar thing at Disneyland where I think it's the Star Tours extended queue. You can see where uh, the, peop- the track the people mover used to take or rocket rods. And there's another in Space Mountain where you would never see it unless, like, the ride stopped and the lights were on but you can see some blacked out windows that used to be where you could see into Space Mountain from the people mover or rocket rods briefly. Yeah, and that's uh, and that's another reason that I'm all, I, I don't hate on Disneyland, but one reason that I'm so hesitant to love Disneyland is uh, to like, well, I love Disneyland, but I'm so hesitant to be like, Disneyland is the peak, um, is just because uh, of castle parks. Because when I, uh, when I went this summer, I walked through Tomorrowland and it was the most depressing yeah. experience. It's there's nothing there. There's nothing. It's what Buzz Lightyear, Space Mountain, Ant Man and the Wasp preview is what was there when I was there. Yeah, it's and a then, little bit of a mess. Yeah, and that, then what else? Uh, Star Tours. I mean, and then you have like Star Wars Launch Bay, which it's it's very unfortunate that both in both interventions have now turned into meet and greets. Mm-hmm. Um, not that Interventions was the most innovating concept, ironically, um, but I, I think it's just it's very it, it's very sad to uh, to see that the old Carousel Theater mm-hmm. um, that had so much history. Um, right. I mean, not I, I'm glad Carousel Progress because that those animatronics or the the show itself, I should say, has has more history. But it's it's yeah. So you know it's unfortunate. I uh, well, you know a- it is sad because you know first it was Carousel of Progress, which was amazing, and then it was America Sings, which, from what I can tell, was pretty cool as well. And now it's just a meet and greet. You know, I mean, I know it was um, interventions for a while, but even that was always kind of hit or miss. So it's sad to see what it's yeah. um, become. And it's one of my fears is that more attractions will take that route. I mean, Stitch's Great Escape is now a meet and greet. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just, I mean, well, it is for now. I don't know what they're going to do with it. It's Because now there's two tracks. I, uh, the bad part about writing a book is I had to put all these future-proof th- sentences in there, like, if it's gone by oh, the time yeah. you're there. or So um, So hopefully it lasts. I hadn't and thought so of that, I, but that's can... a really interesting point because, like, when we make our videos, um, we have the luxury of we could always make another one or a follow-up. or right. Um, but with a book, that's make a more pamphlet. Yeah, but like, yeah, but like with a book, it's more permanent. You know, you're not going to go through the entire process just for a little note, like, oh, by the way, this changed. So, so was that pretty right. difficult then? Like having to really make sure that you had to f- kind of future proof it within reason. Right. So some things I really future proofed, like such a great escape. I, you know, I mentioned at the very, I think in the knowledge mm-hmm. that oh, Tron light cycles are coming. When I was talking about the other parks, like Epcot, things are coming, things will be leaving. Right. Like Hollywood Studios, this is a very temporary ghost town. Because um, when I started writing the book, Toy Story Land hadn't opened, but by mm-hmm. the time I was, you know, sending it to the printers, it had. So I had to add that. Um, it's just one of those, one of those things where. Uh, you know, because the parks are ever changing, you really can't guarantee that that book. I mean, tomorrow they could close Monsters Inc. Laugh Floor, and then right. I have a giant chapter about it. But then that reads, I guess, kind of like a defunct land file, so you could just scratch it out for yourself. Um, and I liked what you pointed out in um, in the Laugh Floor. Um, some of the the again the remnants of the past, you know, that are um, right up there. Because I agree. Yeah, I like love... how the, the theater looks super weird. <laughs> yeah. I'm, but I agree. I, I love remnants over references. Because then you can be like, oh, that's where that used to be, and that's where this used to be, rather than, oh, that's just something they put in as a tribute. Right. And, I mean, please, I, I, I'm glad that they do tributes, and I hope they keep doing them. You be, Universal is so terrible at doing tributes, I think we talked about this. Yeah, yeah, um, we were talking about that. Yeah, is that day. like we were like, well, they did good with Harry Potter and Jaws, but besides that, there's not a whole lot. Like they want you to forget the past, or yeah. they don't. They just don't care about it themselves, um, which you know to them. But Disney usually does an okay job of adding a few references. I mean, there's a couple in Winnie the Pooh. There's a couple in um, 
Uh, there's a lot in Space Mountain, despite it never having replaced anything. Um, right. And, you know, just all these. And uh, there's a there's a few. I mean, Stitch's Great Escape has remnants, mm-hmm. and then Monsters Inc. Laugh Floor. I don't. I mean, has remnants. I mean, those those bubble tubes. Right. Um, that were just left there. Uh, all the TVs are still old as hell. Right. Um, or. And so, uh, yeah, so it's just, I, I always find those remnants. And I talk about both the remnants and the references in the book. Um, and that's kind of another major point of the book is just like, if you love extinct history, then this is your place to go. Because I'll give you all your hidden Mickeys or the versions of right. that. And then one point you bring up that I totally agree with, it's kind of a double-edged sword kind of thing. You you talk a little bit about uh, what happens to like animatronics when they, you know, when they get replaced or, um, wait, is that spoil? Is that part of spoiler? Or is that not spoiler? Well, it's, it, I talk about it in that, ch- in those, so chapter seven and eight, if you have not read the book are spoiler territory, but you, we can talk about the subject. Cause I do talk about it throughout it as long as, you know, you don't mention what I do with that, but okay. yeah, no, the, uh, we, I, I do, I do reference okay. the, uh, the extinct, the extinct animatronics or what really happens with them. Um, and yeah, so that we might want to save that for spoilers because that is a that that's not even it's not a, it's not a spoiler for me, but it's such a surprising, um, not surprise it's such a shocking idea because you, you you think that oh you know when when the animatronics are done they're destroyed right uh, or they're you know or or they're you you don't or you think that they're really scrapped for parts or you know you really don't think about what happens to them or they're preserved, um, and then as we know. I guess spoiler alert right now is that they they're not scrapped for parts immediately. They are slowly scrapped for parts, like a really slowly. Mm-hmm. So a good example is which I talk about in the book is in the old because um, uh, the Country Bear Jamboree used to have a post show bar, which was like a little tavern called the Mile Long Bar with mirrors on either side, which I think was really cool. Um, and they had the animatronic heads of Buff, Max, and Melvin. And I think Max is now under the Madame Leota scene in the Haunted Mansion. And his, like, eye is taken out and some mm-hmm. of his, like, neck is taken out. But he's still intact. It's not like they – there's no Imagineer, like, laid him out specifically, well, this part can go here and we can work – It's you're not taking him apart and separating the Legos into their own bins. Right. You're just taking it, throwing him on the ground, and as needed – whatever engineer that is on on hand that day is just ripping it into him. It reminds me of like a horror movie almost like, I don't know, this right. kind of, you know, it's like he's just piece by piece, like a Saw movie kind of thing. And it's sad and it's even creepier that it's in the Haunted Mansion. Like of all places to put something like that, you know, it's as if it needed to be even creepier. Like that's terrifying to think that if I just kind of were to like jump over that area and I could just see this dismembered animatronic of the past that's pretty it's pretty sad yeah it's it, it's just uh that, that's and that was the catalyst for the ensuing five, two chapters well i think it brings up an interesting conversation where you know obviously they can't spare and save every single animatronic from every single ride but when it comes to the really iconic animatronics or really or the ones that are from really iconic attractions that maybe there can be more use of them rather than just sparing or rather than just using them for parts. Um, so I, I, that's why I love those displays they do once in a while where like in Disneyland, they had the original Barker bird or anything like that um, or use them as like a, an Easter egg, like in Winnie the Pooh, you know, when you're near the end, uh, you can turn around and see the heads mounted on the wall, which was from, you know, country bear jamboree but is that an easter egg <laughs> in the you're talking about the disneyland right yeah uh, of of those they're not visible i, I when i they wrote are. it i was unless, shocked unless they're, they changed no, it no they're not they, unless they changed they're, it because i remember the, so many times being able to turn around and see see them turn around they're not in your eyesight until you turn around right it's it's they're just kind of hanging there creepily and they're not moving. It's as if they couldn't remove them easily. So they just left them. You know what I mean? I had assumed that it, they like did that as an, like, Oh, if you turn around, you can see them rather than that's where they original is, is that where they originally were? I imagine hmm. because it's, isn't it directly 
It depends. I don't know when the mile long bar closed and whether those animatronics remained in there. Because if I'm thinking correctly, isn't that after the scene of Teddy Barra? Isn't that the uh, swinging Teddy Barra, who is now Winnie the Pooh's hot air balloon? Am I, am I, am I just saying things that are correct? No, I mean, I, w- <laughs> I was talking about Disneyland. This is where it gets confusing when you're I, talking about... I'm, like, also talking, I'm also talking about Disneyland. Because if you... I'll pull up a ride through right now. The uh, if you look at the Winnie the Pooh at Disneyland, um, it's I'm trying to think. Um, dang it, my mind is just because the the Winnie the Pooh Winnie the movie no Winnie the Pooh at Disneyland. You're going through and remember there's that yeah it's after they, the they use the same swing area. from Teddy Bear. You know remember this where Teddy Bear used to come out of the ceiling. Mm-hmm. They they repurpose that as, I think it's his hot air balloon in one of the scenes. Really, almost possible. See, I didn't know that. Or I, some sort of thing, maybe a bucket. Let's see. But that that'd be interesting to find out whether they put them the three heads up there, the mounted heads, or whether that that's where they originally were and they just never bothered to remove them. I'd always assumed yeah. the former. Right, you would think so. Um, I thought there was at the Many Adventures Disneyland there was a scene where Pooh was in a hot air balloon. Right? Am yeah. I crazy? No, there is. Near is the, there? I think so. Okay, that yes, 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 there is. I just found it. Um, that was you know you know that was Teddy Barra, right? Mm-hmm. So that was I mean so at that point you were in the Country Bear Hall. So you can map out. It'd be interesting to map out to see that if be. that's where they would be, because you you know exactly where Teddy Bear would have been, and you know what Country Bear Hall looks like. So you can probably point and you know get a good idea of where everything else is. I'm gonna so totally I, do I, that I, I don't, <laughs> later, because I'm so curious now if that is actually if they just couldn't remove them because they are just. They're just sitting there lifeless. Oh, they're creepy. It doesn't. F- I just. I just always they're thought that was so cool creepy. to turn around and be like, "Oh, they're you know." Rather no, than thought, I mean, just not, you know. Now, would you rather have that or them removed? And like, would you rather have them be there? Well, and clearly, creepy, I'd rather removed? have them. Be, I'd. I'd rather have them be there and creepy. But it just. It just makes me wonder whether that was a purposeful thing. I mean, because the tubes, in. Monsters Inc. Laugh For, which you talk about in the book, which are just water bubbles. I imagine that wasn't a, oh, let's leave these in here because right. it's a great uh, reference to Timekeeper. They were probably like, well, that's it's there. Let's leave it right. in. A lot <laughs> you know of the time, I mean? well, it's kind of um, like um, Confrontation. I know I mentioned this a while ago, how um, if you're riding the mummy and you look up, um, you see the, the tracks for Confrontation that are still there. And... Um, that's an interesting like debate between remnants and Easter eggs, you know, or not, re- or remnants that were left there purposefully because they just couldn't, um, you know, get rid of them, versus ones that were left there on purpose as like, oh, this is a nice reference, you know, like the intent. Right, it's yeah. all about the intention. For confrontation, it was like they couldn't do it without ripping the roof off, but it's cool to look up and be like, okay, that's where the track. You know, you literally see the like the track, the whole. Like through at least two or three parts of the ride, if you look up, you can see the track layout. Um, but obviously, that wasn't for the sake of fans. That was for the uh, cost. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm, I don't even know. I mean, if we're if we're talking Disneyland's Winnie the Pooh, I'm not even sure what the old Country Bear Hall looked like. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what the layout was and how much they added. I don't know enough about history of that because um, Country Bear, the original, still exists. And that's something that, I, you know, I mentioned at the early stages of the book. I was like, I'm not used to the present. So I'm trying out, you know, what it's like to learn about attractions that are here now. We do uh, tend to you know, live in the past, don't we? <laughs> yes. it's like We just jump from place in the past to place in the past. And it's... Uh, it's and that's okay, I think, because I, uh, that I that's what I like doing, and I don't really care to do much else. I think sometimes there's a misconception, though, that, um, and I'm sure for some people it's the case, but like, oh, you only live in the past and do the past because you're you don't like the present or you're not a fan of, you know, the present uh, state of the parks and blah blah. blah. It's like no, I just I'm fascinated right. by history, 
and th- there are some people mm-hmm. that they just hate anything new, you know, but that's not my opinion. That's not yours. And a lot of uh, us that cover historical aspects, like there are aspects of the present that we're not a fan of or disagree with, but it's not like we have some kind of disdain for anything new. We just love history. And, but a lot of people think that, you know, right. Yeah. I think it's also just because the, the entire purpose of our channel, not purpose, the entire draw of the channels that we run is, is more of, you know, you, you, uh, you love something because you can't have it, mm. or uh, you only appreciate something after it's gone, um, and that's so true. That's the draw: is that you, we do like inherently take advantage of every attraction that is existing right now by design because we are so focused on what used to be there. Um, so no, we will never fully appreciate what is here, and that's kind of. I mean, we'll get into the end of the book, but that's a that's kind of a, a, something I struggle with. Um, you know, tr- trying to think personally of what, how important is it? You know. How important is is um, is the present, and uh, what what role does it play in someone that's interested in history or that is stuck in the right. past, both emotionally and yeah, intellectually? Right. Yeah. Because uh, intellectually I, stuck in the past sounds like you're a, like you're not progressive. <laughs> I should say, uh, uh, historically stuck in the past as far as what you're interested. In. Yeah. Like I made a Twitter kind of half joking, half not about because I wrote um, Fast and the Furious, and I thought it was one of, if not the worst attractions I've ever been on, um, in terms of like a full theme, you know, not, not counting like carnival rides or whatever, but in terms of big budget attractions, I was not impressed. But anyways, I was saying, oh, they should have just, um, you know, rebuilt back to the future. And I'm sure it would have been as popular, if not more so. But anyway, someone thought that was being like serious and like, it was something like, you know, that would be a terrible business decision and blah, blah, blah. I was like, I, I, I'm aware, like, I wasn't being serious, because I know, you know, business-wise, yeah, that wouldn't make sense to, do, you know, to do right. that. I don't know, it, it's that fine line, I guess, between being passionate about the past and loving old attractions, some that you got to go on, whether you got to go on them or not, um, and then, like, being okay with change, but you have to see it from, like, a business perspective, you know, or, like, a... Um, you kind of get into that a little bit at the end. Like you have to put yeah, the, if, yourself in their shoes. You wanna... Right, exactly. And that's what I, with the series and we can probably do a spoiler break so we can just stop alluding to the end <laughs> and we can just talk about right. it because we've, you know, we've, we've, hit, we've touched on the major aspects of the book, I think. Um, and now to get into specifics, I know it's kind of uh, not crippling. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's more difficult not to talk about it than to just allude to it. But I will say that before that is that one of the reasons I wrote the book is I was able to just put my full personality. I'm able to talk about whatever I want. I'm talk about the opinions with the videos. I have to have that objective. What's going on at the time? What's right. going on with the business? What's going on? Why did they do this from a business perspective? Why did they do this from a creative perspective? But with the book, I can, you know, reference that that exists, but I'm also, my voice is more strong and that was very freeing in my, you know, my comedy and my opinions. And it was, it was very nice um, versus having to um, be strictly realistic. And because, you know, if you were realist, if you were 100% realistic on everything that happens at Disney, apart from a few people, everyone is making the decision that is right for the time. And that is right for what they believe. It might've been the wrong decision in the long run, but, Everybody's just, nobody's doing something to like when they even when they greenlit Fast and Furious Supercharged, they weren't like let's make a terrible attraction. Right. They thought, well, this is what makes sense based off this, this, and this. People want this, and so let's do this. And we were successful with the Kong. Let's do you know, and it's and let's do a similar thing. It's just a. Uh, it's unfortunate that that the you know high. I mean, it's unfortunate that people can't always guess the future, but that's what makes the history later on so interesting. And so, like, you have to grin and bear attractions like Fast and Furious, Supercharged. You have to put up with attractions like Stitch's Great Escape. But without them, if it was just hit after hit after hit, what a boring history for this medium of art, right? Right. Like, if they never got rid of any attractions, there wouldn't be any history. Right, exactly. You know? But I I think it's finding a balance. Like, I know it's blasphemy to say, but, you know, there are certain attractions like Ellen's Energy Adventure where... 
I felt like it was time for it to go. Um, I may, I prefer it. I, I would have liked for it to be replaced by <laughs> um, something maybe more original and non-Marvel. Uh, we'll see how that turns out. But, you know, I've heard some people say, you know, no, they should have just refurbished it and, and kept it and redid the animatronics. And, and I thought, no, it, it, it served its purpose. It was great for the time, but it was time mm-hmm. for something to be done. Again, wish it wasn't just a Marvel ride, but we'll see how that is. But then you have an attraction like Figment where I feel like unanimously everyone kind of thinks something really needs to be done um, to the attraction. Yeah. Uh, I rode Journey into Imagination the other day, Journey into Imagination with Figment, and it was, every time I ride it, it is, it's also, it's a terrifying attraction, yep. first of all. That it, the entire attraction is horrifying. It's just scary, even to me. That moment when the lights go out and the, the roof rises and all the Figments come down is the most scary thing to me. I don't know why. That's actually, um, it's funny it's though, because that to me is like the only impressive part of the entire attraction. Like it is scary, like, cause you're like, what's going on? But it is cool how fast that happens, you know? And if you don't see it coming, but yeah, it's terrifying. And you're looking around and it's almost like you're in a, on an acid trip nightmare. And then you see, <laughs> you know, the big moon face and it is pretty trippy. Um, especially when you know what it used to be, um, and I guess that's actually one of the few attractions I would say um, I think that had they just kept it and updated it and given it a really nice refurbishment, it would still be as popular today as it was back then. I think it would have aged just fine um, just with like updates here and, and there. I, yeah, and I, I love – and it's just uh, – that I mean that was a series of business decisions. Um that just was was very wrong, and I mean, just Epcot. I want to write a book about. I don't want to get too much into it because I don't want to get too off track. But we should have me back on. We can talk about how depressing Epcot is right now, um, they're, without Horizons they're and trying without Journey to, fix to Imagination. It, but but yeah, they're not. They're I, not. They're they're not trying to fix it. They're trying to. They're trying to do. I mean, it's again band aid fixes. They're trying mm, to. Yeah. They treat Epcot the same way they're treating Disney California Adventure, which is true. Blasphemous. It's blasphemous. It's ridiculous. Also, by the way, um, I did look up um, earlier the the answer to our question of if it if those are moved or not, mm. and it looks as though they did move. They they, they did move them. So supposedly, but um, it is so close to that scene in the Country Bear Hall that I believe it's the eight because the. A uh, mile-long bar also existed in Disneyland. They th- mm-hmm. people are saying that the mile-long bar versions were there, and they just condensed. They just moved them a little closer to each other. So m- perhaps, perhaps they were. It was just a move of well, they're here, so let's just leave them here. Or maybe they 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 put a lot of effort into making sure they hid them in the most creepy place possible. <laughs> right. Yeah. That that is pretty. But I every time I ride it, I end up turning around and um, seeing just just reminiscing when there was a better attraction. I actually enjoy Winnie the Pooh for what it is. Uh, I've always found the Country Bears a little terrifying. It always reminds me of like a Five Night at Freddy's kind of thing, especially when the animatronics aren't like on that day where the eyes are droopy. And I always think like if the lights turned off and like a spotlight hit them and the music changed, it'd be like a (laughs) horror, like, you know, uh, like a horror movie. All Disney attractions are one step away from a horror show. I mean, Carousel Progress is one malfunction away from just uh, turning into the creepiest. You're trapped. They told you not to leave. There's no exits. So they could have a Mickey's So Scary Halloween and just do that. Just, like, yeah. reprogram. <laughs> oh, like I, like last year for Halloween Hor- Halloween Horror Nights, um, uh, Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween, they had, you know, a trick-or-treat area in the um, Alien Encounter. And you know, you know the pre-show? Um, with the robots and, you know, everything. Yeah, yeah, with the Sir and Skippy. Of course, he, of course, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the times it's like, I, I, why even bother saying, you know, are you aware of? Because it's like, of course you know. But um, <laughs> Right, yeah. Like, uh, did it, you know about Alien? Kind of like, yeah, dude, I just wrote a book. I know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so they're, uh, the main robot, the, I forget his name, but, like, his hand 
was just moving up and down really slightly. It was re- it was like the creepiest thing. It was the only thing moving. Just his hand was moving like up and down mm-hmm. and up and down, and it was terrifying. So if they just took that and did that with all the attractions, it'd be it could be on par with Halloween Horror Nights. Yeah, or uh, or do that thing that uh, Spaceship Earth did. Or, I mean, those was, wasn't that on Spaceship Earth that one animatronic malfunction that was it was just shaking. Like, yeah, you know, it was, I saw it, that. It looked like t- it looked like the shaker from Country Bear, but it wasn't supposed to do it. It was just like freaking out. Yeah, there are so many like videos you see like that where like a head will be off, and it's like how traumatizing for like a kid like, that doesn't. Know well, any my better. favorite is a uh, my favorite is when Mrs. Incredible's face fell off. Have you seen that video? I didn't. I think I saw a picture, but I didn't see a video. One hundred percent, the funniest video. Look up. Uh, Elastigirl, Miss, Mrs. Incredible's face falling off. Um, it's the funniest thing because she just walks out like it's like, and it's it's at the stage where Stitch is Supersonic Celebration. It was the stage that was created for that show, but it was they used it for some Incredibles thing a couple years ago, and it was just like, now come, it's like Elastigirl, and she walks out, and then she just trips like and doesn't fall the way down, but like her face falls off, and I'm not talking like her head falls off like it's not like mickey that entire head mask falls off her face is somehow not attached to the rest of her head so her hair her plastic hair and the back of her head still there just her face goes flying and it is the funniest thing i've ever seen watching it right now hold on a second she's walking on (laughs) oh Oh, oh, man that is so funny (laughs) <laughs> it is, isn't that the funniest thing you've ever seen? Like, uh, what, I, <laughs> it's just, like, I like the girl who turns around. She's like, "What?" That's uh, I love the I love that when I type this into YouTube, YouTube was oh my gosh, YouTube was like, uh, "You want?" I said, "Mrs. Incredible," and the next thing was face falls off, um, which really shows uh, that YouTube knows me and knows what I'm gonna look up before I look it up. Um, I was gonna say, I think it's interesting though because. If something like that had happened in the 80s, the 90s, the early, early 2000s, we probably wouldn't have seen it, you know? And I think it's interesting that the more, you know, now that we're in the age where everyone has a phone on them and everyone has a camera, that really you're, you're going to see so much more of that. Every malfunction, every time an animatronic freaks out. And in the past, it was always just rumors and myths and legends like, oh, my my uncle told me about this time and then that's where you get into like the creepy pastas and it's just weird that we're living now in this time where you can capture that and have proof of it yeah whereas even 10 years ago or you know it's like it was so much more rare to find like footage um you know like a good example is when the tiki room in disneyland uh, i think it was 2001 i have it in one of my videos um like the uh, the A-frame like collapsed, and uh, Udi. Oh really? Yeah, Udi, the tiki goddess, was in the A-frame and it, like collapsed. Um, and there's like three photos of it, and that's it. And it makes sense because it was you know 2001, I think. Um, but if that had happened now, like it would be all over the internet, all over YouTube, if an entire front of a building just like collapsed. You would never see yeah, that. Or uh, now that would be everywhere. But for those back then, you only ha- you're you're lucky if you can find like a photograph of it. Well, imagine Disneyland's opening day, with right? Cell phones. Like, how crazy would that be to see everything that was going wrong and people were filming it? Um, but yeah, it's, it's just. Uh, Imagine seeing the phantom boats. Anyway, or all the, the keel stuff boats. that probably happened Like, there's those. that one picture of the keel boat that I used in my thumbnail. The sinking. Like, that one. Yeah, the na- sinking. Yeah, nowadays, it'd be, like, all over the place. Yeah, you'll, you'd see all of it. And that's, uh, and I think that takes, honestly, and this is, this might sound weird, but I think that takes away some of the magic mm-hmm. of talking about these extinct attractions because it takes away, what I love about what we do and I'm not speaking for you. Just since we no, do no. similar things, is that what I what I love is that I really I think that it's so much fun to recreate. Okay, so a couple years back at D23, mm-hmm. they had a pa- panel with Tony Baxter where he recreated Journey into Imagination mm-hmm. through a series of. Have you seen this? 
Uh, yeah, it was like through a series of concept art and then just playing the audio track to the to the ride, um, and just which worked okay, um, but he didn't include on ride footage that often. I just think that that is pretty much what we do is we take okay we have all this media it's right. a very limited amount and we now have to take someone on a ride that is gone through the media that we have available to us. And doing that, we have to get really creative to the point of even sometimes using photos or you use, you know, movie clips or mm-hmm. references to things that um, that just have to supplement for that lack of material. What was really hard, I just did an episode on Club Disney. That was open in five locations for less than three years, and no one was in there taking photos or video. Right. It was only newspapers um, that were doing it. And so, but I still had to create this picture and it's partly through narration and it's partly through images and with this by combining everything hopefully you can at least make someone understand you're never going to get that experience back which is again a huge idea in the book that's explored but you can we our job is to at least make you just to reference it you know right you know, if, yeah and, and that's half if the fun if we can't make you, you know, yeah exactly is recreating yeah. it so if you can't bring you know. it back yeah so i think that uh that, that recreating that is is part of the – if the finished product, not only do we hopefully, you know, make people experience it for the first time in a, in a much lesser form, but we also – if someone's written it in the past and they didn't realize it, just by recreating it in the form that we could, right. it snaps a memory. I get comments like that all the time, like, I forgot that I wrote this until I watched this video. And so that's really cool. Those are my favorite kind of comments where you just mm-hmm. – you know, those kind of things. Um, I was going to say – oh, I was going to – so to me, I don't know if you feel the same way. I am always more interested in covering an attraction the less there is of it, the less footage, the less mm-hmm. images, because I love having to be more creative with telling the story rather than, um, you know, a, re- a more recent um, closed attraction where there's a ton of video and there's a ton of images. I don't know. Do you find? Are you? Do you feel that way? Where the ones that have the least amount available, that you really have to be creative in how to tell the story. Um, do you prefer those it, over? Um, I don't know. I th- I find my 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 most I mean, the favorite episodes for me to do are the ones that because there's two aspects we're talking about. We're talking about you know physical media and then story. Um, the, you know, we have to create a three X structure out of something that happened in real life and real life doesn't exist in three X structures. Um, it exists in, you know, as Mm -hmm. every day is another act. Um, and so to create a three X structure out of something that happened is always the most interesting to me. So the harder it is to create that three X structure, but I can still see the glimpses of it. So for example, like I'm, I'm telling a long story, you know, I start at Euro Disney and then I tell the fall of Eisner from 1992 mm-hmm. to eventually maybe 2005. Um, and that's really interesting to me to try to do that. Um, and it's not just – it's because I have to take um, all of these things, all of um, – what's the way to put it? You, ha- I have to take every single um, – what am I trying to say? Every single storyline – and try to give them a specific attraction. It's uh, I can this short series that I'm doing within the season that I'm doing to uh, I, I compare it to the Jobs movie that Michael Fassbender was in. Oh, I love that movie. Um, if you if you've seen that, yeah. So they took they tried to tell the Steve Jobs story in three acts, mm-hmm. three specific products. I'm doing the same thing with Eisner and theme park rides or theme parks. So starts with Euro Disney. Euro Disney fails. Mm-hmm. We talk about Space Mountain and how it saved it. Then we go into Disney's America and Disney's America's failure. Then we go into Club Disney and Club Disney's failure. Then Disney Quest and Disney Quest failure. Then Superstar Limo and California Adventures failure. Then maybe Hong Kong Disneyland in the end of his tenure. And that tells everything you need to know. It go, it goes over Frank Wells' death. It goes over Jeffrey Katzenberg's mm-hmm. struggle. It goes after Michael Ovitz. Like it goes through all of these things by having these stepping stones. That is what's most interesting to me. I find it often frustrating, but you're the editor, right? I mean, you come from an editing background, and you're very much more, um, more than me in you know in in sync with you and your editing. So, which is, and I'm more of a writer, and I so I think that's probably why I find that more fascinating. You find the challenge of editing something together to your narration probably more interesting. That might be the difference, but but equally interesting. I mean, yes and no. I think to me it's more just 
just the investigation aspect of it. Um, you know, if there's a ride where, you know, you can get all the information from a Wikipedia page, I just don't tend to find those as interesting as something that's a little bit more obscure. Um, like a good example is the Universal Studios Florida tram tour video that I'm finishing up today because it's fascinating to me that so many people don't know about it, that there's so little photographic evidence, there's so little video evidence, and all of it's unofficial. You know, these are things that I'm having to find through, like, my family trip video of 1995, and I don't know, it's more of the the investigation aspect, the finding things that maybe no one's yeah. seen, um, uncovering photos and video that are rare, um, like, don't get me wrong, I love telling stories, and even if there's tons of information, it's still, I love telling stories and creating a strong narrative, but I guess if I were to summarize what really, what really gets me going, it's like stories like the tram tour, or like even my broken and abandoned effects, which was like one of my first videos, where it was all these effects that either people didn't know about or they thought there were myths and having to like find proof of it I guess in a way um and I guess bring stories to light that maybe people don't know about or bring v images and visuals to life that many people didn't know existed or you know yeah that kind of thing yeah no I, I find that a lot with you know if it's too easy if there's too many references, if there's too many pictures, if there's too much information, it's almost harder in a way. Mm -hmm. over, it's not harder. I appreciate the challenge of having to do it myself and having to actually, you know, really dig deep and find these images. But then at the same time, I'm more content knowing that there's not a lot else out there versus, you know, when I'm doing Disney Quest right now. I'm like, I know there's a thousand thousands and right. thousands of videos of Disney Quest. Am I using the best one? Am I using the right one? Is mm -hmm. there a better image? Is there a better video? And that gives me the most um, anxiety when I'm editing because I'm like, oh my gosh, um, oh, there's just so many. I, I'm overwhelmed versus Club Disney where I'm like, you know, struggling right. to to fill time. But I know that what I'm getting is unique and the way I'm putting it together has never been seen before. Right. Yeah, no, because like I remember, I forget which one it was. Maybe it was Jaws. It was some attraction where I thought I had, you know, and it, it still was like not super common, but there's a lot of footage of it. I forget which one it was. Um, but anyways, like it was like a week after the video came out and I came across like the coolest footage of whatever it was, some animatronic. And that happens a lot where you think you have everything and then you stumble upon an even better shot an even better photo. And so I guess it, it is a little, e when it's a, a really rare thing, when it's something that really is hard to come by, you are more confident that, you know, that you have probably the best that's out there. But I guess yeah. but it makes sense. So, that yeah. So you like it more from the writing perspective, the narrative, the creating a, like kind of a unified narrative versus I guess for me, it's more of the investigation of it. Um, I guess that's probably yeah, the best I, I way think, to I think what you're... I mean, I, I could be wrong. I think what you're really describing is you you like finding the space, especially probably when you're thinking of an extinct ride, is you like finding, like, where exactly is this, and do I have a picture of it? And, you know, really creating a 3D space, both in your editing and in your mind, of what used to be. That, specifically for me, and of course, stop me if I'm wrong, um, that sometimes is more, again, it, it's more frustrating for me because I'm like, okay, like especially so I'm researching for Horizons right now, and it's a very difficult ride mm -hmm. to lay out. And 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 the more that I understand it, the le it's not that I'm having fun understanding it. I'm just like, okay, did I get it? But that might be something that you, uh, your part of your research, you really enjoy, figuring out like, okay, how exactly is this laid I out? I guess, because yeah, I guess I kind of thrive on that, the like challenge because it is really frustrating, but, and again, if there's just like a ton of video and photos of it, and it's something mm -hmm. that's so commonly well known, and it's been covered and um, done all over the place, I just don't really have as much of an interest in telling that story. I want to be able to bring something new to the table, whether it's in a narrative sense or in terms of the visuals. Absolutely. I think this also goes back to what we were originally talking about when we got into this tangent was that, uh, you know, it's um, whenever you 
you know, it's the newer stuff is almost less interesting. So Great Movie Ride, as I use as an example, mm. you know, that is that's not the most interesting because right before it closed, we had people going in with high def 360 right. cameras getting every inch of the ride from a thousand different angles. So you can literally ride the ride again in a way, you know, not the same way, but you could versus if you had wings was a dark ride, right. like a literally dark ride that you get to kind of build to be your ride in your mind. And that's one thing that I think also makes extinct attractions compelling is because, and it makes anything like you also do lost media through like your lost TV episodes mm-hmm. um, that, you know, you can't find just the idea that, you know, whoever's watching or listening, they're not the, your, the image that you're going to paint in your mind when you describe it is different than what they're going to paint. And if you give them the opportunity, you know, tell them enough to paint that picture, but not so much that it negates what they're trying to, you know, il- illustrate right. in their own mind. That is so interesting and so compelling. So to you say, this, is ex- this extinct attraction used to exist. Here's a picture of it. Here's a picture of it. Here's a picture of it. Now we're here. Here's a, like here. Like try to map it out best you can, but they get to fill in those gaps. And then that's what gives them an emotional connection to it because it's now partly their creation. Right. And that's what I think yeah. is some is an experience that something that's no longer there can actually elevate on something that is because there's not much more to Fast and Furious Supercharged. But when it right. closes and if we didn't have videos of it and I was describing it to you, you might have created a better attraction in your mind than what we actually ro- ride yeah. when we go there. Yeah, because that, that makes sense because like um, two videos I loved doing, they're probably my favorite in terms of the research aspect, um, were like the broken and abandoned uh, theme park effects. Because I love the idea mm-hmm. of something that was there that isn't anymore and that hardly anyone saw. And again, it goes down to like like the Indiana Jones ice effect. Like so many people would be like, oh, it wasn't real, never existed. And, um, you know, it did. And so finding like the three clips that I could find of it actually working. Um, like when you told me about the, um, the, the bubble effects and the laugh factory, I was like, that would be an amazing, like, remnants, video, you know, like, remnants that are left over from these attractions. That's where my mind went instantly rather right, than yeah. the, the narrative of it. I just love things that used to be there, whether it's media or Disneyland, whether it's theme parks or movies or TV shows, and just it's gone. You know, like the um, Wicked Witch of the West Sesame Street episode. Um, I was fascinated by the fact that it aired once, and there's just nothing. I mean, just nothing. Yeah, exactly. You know? And again, and that's always going to be more creepy than actually getting to see what it was, and more more interesting. I think where I think you were, maybe were going with it when you brought this up is that in 50 years, now that everything is so well documented, everything is so well, you know, everyone has a camera. Are you know? Uh, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but like, are you able? Basically, will the attractions of today be as interesting or fun to explore with just how much there is of it? I mean, there's got to be like a thousand, you know, plus videos of Temple Over the Forbidden Eye and every little nook and cranny has already been kind of explored. So I don't know if there would even be much to do a history of on in like, a hundred years if it ever were to be closed. Yeah. I think it's hard and uh, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to say that now because you know, in the 90s it felt like the modern era, but now in hindsight, the 90s were one of the cheesiest weirdest times <laughs> and it was so specific. Like, you know, you do, you never really understand what your the era you're living is going to feel like. You know, because right. the 80s to me feel very you know, if you're looking at Disney history, you feel very cold. You know, it's a very, you right. know, because it's when they were, they weren't doing very well. 90s, very vibrant, very yeah. weird and wacky. 2000s, uh, early 2000s is just, um, you know, kind of just, you know, scary decline, like something's going wrong. And um, then you look at the 70s and, it, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just one of those things that, you know, I think that there'll, you, there'll be a story to tell. It's just going to be so. <laughs> you're going to look like you're producing a really well made documentary, right. versus what we're we look like we're doing is we're you know patch patchwork, right? Um, which I find more fun, but so, who knows? You know, in 50 years when we're still doing these, yeah. Like if you look at the haunted mansion, the Hatbox Ghost, you know, if there was 
um, like just a ton of photos and a ton of video of it, to me, it wouldn't be nearly as fascinating as the fact that, you know, it was there such a short amount of time. There's like one, uh, uh, I think Disney History Institute is like the one person that had footage of it on like an, you know, an eight millimeter camera or whatever. But that's part of what makes it fascinating to me is the fact that there's just so little of it. Right, exactly. So let's get into a little bit about the ending of your book, um, Saving. Sure. Um, Because it takes on spoilers. spoilers, Yeah, spoilers, everyone. So don't don't listen to this part if you haven't read it. So it it takes on and again, kind of going back to what I said in the very beginning of this podcast, where you balance um, a lot of aspects very well. You, You know, it's a guidebook for someone who hasn't been to the Magic Kingdom ever. It's great for a casual theme park fan or someone like me where you can find bits and pieces that maybe you didn't know about. And then I find it interesting that the book takes on a very different tone um, near the end. So can you go, what made you decide to to, um, uh, do that? And uh, yeah, just explain a little bit about uh, what led you to that last act of the book. Well, I mentioned this in some other interviews and I'll, and I'll try to give, you know, a different perspective here. Um, but essentially the, the short answer is, you know, that I couldn't just end the book. I couldn't say, well, that was eventually and have a good day. <laughs> um, it just felt incomplete. And because right. I'm so narratively driven, um, I, I wanted to create a story. And because my, my character was so present, uh, not my character, me as Kevin, as a character in the book is so present and you, we become such great friends, you know, as mm-hmm. far as the book goes. Um, throughout that it just felt so wrong to just not end it. And so I wanted it to lead up to this big climax. And, you know, I wrote a bunch of different endings. And um, so this is something I haven't really talked about is the other endings. Uh, Well, the ending right now is if you haven't read it and you're listening, stop listening. But if you have (laughs) not read it and you are listening, essentially what we're talking about is at the end, chapter seven, I take you to the Utilidors to steal the timekeeper. And then you steal the timekeeper, get arrested, go to Orange County Jail, um, Michael Eisner comes and breaks you out, gets in a lightsaber fight with Bob Iger, and then you escape onto in into an Uber, and then you like uh, go to downtown Disney and eat some ganache, and then it's over. Um, and I also give you some words before you leave. But essentially, all of that it was originally this weird underground society. I was like, I'm going to set up a big book series, and it's going to be a like this whole like weird underground extinct attraction society. And I was like, mm. this is stupid. It doesn't make any sense. The, um, and I, it got a little, uh, I've, I've not read the entire series of uh, well, the kingdom keepers, mm-hmm. but I read the first one and I was like, well, maybe they did this later on. And I was like, I don't want it to sound too much like the kingdom right. keepers. Um, but, but I, uh, but I, I really did want to give a, you know, a, a climactic ending. And so I become kind of the antagonist at the end of the book of telling you like, you should steal this and we're going to, we're going to, I'm the mad scientist that wants to recreate history. And my whole point is these attractions are so temporary. We have to save them. And uh, by doing that, I have you steal the timekeeper. So the reason for the ending was one, not a necessity of just the idea of the story. And also because it led to a message that I, and a, and a conversation, especially with the Michael Eisner mm-hmm. conversation that I, I very much wanted to include and felt necessary for, for the book and the nature of it. Right. And it kind of goes back to um, what we were saying earlier, where you, you, you do have to look at these um, subjects from the shoes of people that are running a company. You know, you may not agree with the decisions you may, you know, you, you just can't, and it's, you know, it's, I think there's a line where it's like that. I think sometimes we tend to, in our minds, think like, oh, Disneyland or Magic Kingdom, it's meant for me. Like, you know, how dare they? Because right. I'm upset about this. But it's not up to us. You know, it's not made for us. There's just so many other factors at play. And I think sometimes we focus a little bit more on um, how we feel about something. Yeah, and that's kind of what I really wanted to touch on was, you know, how do I, um, how, you know, how do I tackle this idea? Because, you know, I am so obsessed with extinct attractions, and so is everyone reading the book, most likely. So what does that mean? The, do, does that mean that we don't want things to change? And, you know, the right. idea of change alone is a, is a major part of the book that I leave unresolved, and I just say, I don't know. 
but I can tell you this, that you should, you know, you should be doing, you should go out and experience things while they're still here. As hard as, as hard as it is, because you're always, uh, you know, stuck in the past, obsessed with the past, looking forward to the future. There are things that exist right now that aren't always going to be there. And so if there's anything to take away from all of this is that go experience them because we don't like, I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm not going to preach to you that change is good because I don't believe that. I'm not going to say that change is always bad because that's just not true, but I can tell you that change is inevitable and you need to go experience these things for yourself before, you know, before they're gone. I think sometimes we get in that mindset of like, oh, it'll never go away because we're, you know, it's like, but it could, and you never know. I mean, we, we Mm -hmm. have a, you know, uh, parks are only, you know, 70 years old, you know, who knows, like in the next 20, 30 years, like what'll happen, what will be there, what won't be there. So you can't really take um, anything for granted, I guess. Because I think a lot of the times it's like, oh, I'll do that on the next trip. But you never know, you know, the biggest attraction could go away. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just, you know, it's, uh, and, and it is, it's disappointing. And it's, uh, I, it's just, it's hard to put into, you know, words in conversation. That's why I, I rewrote that, that ending so many times. Oh, I'm trying to, especially the, you know, the conversation with Michael Eisner of like, you know, using his actual words mm-hmm. um, rather than writing them for him. And, and I think that was a smart a idea. I think, I think that was a wise Thank you. decision. Cause I, I, the next time you're on, it'd be fun to have like a Eisner discussion because, um, yeah. we'll do that another time. But I think it's a very, it's very easy to hate on him because there's a lot of bad decisions he made, but there's good decisions he made. And there are things that we wouldn't have now for better or worse, you know, but right. that he did. And I think, it, you know, it's easy to make him kind of, a, I know we kind of parallel sometimes where, you know, you've kind of had the Eisner as a running gag. I've kind of always had it as like a running gag where, you know, like one time I put his face over um, Mr. Potato Head when he's like, oh, money, 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 you know. And, um, yeah. but, you know, there's he did do a lot of good early on. And he brought a lot of things right. that we wouldn't ha- that things that we love, and I'm sure everyone can think of one thing of the parks that they love that he is in part responsible for, you know, in some way. Well, he's, and I think what I've made him, hopefully in the series, is not someone to be hated. Right. Whenever I get some or disliked, even whenever someone says like, "Oh, Eisner," all I learned from the series is that Eisner is terrible. I'm like, that's not what no. I'm saying. You're supposed to laugh at him because he's a he's a bumbling, you know, kind of a, he's, he's supposed to be the comic relief of this because, and he's also a bit of an antihero or he's a hero that turns into a a villain. Um, in the, in the sense of his history with Disney Mm -hmm. is that he was such a savior to that company along with Frank Wells. And then after Frank Wells death, you realize that he left to his own devices. He can't juggle everything. And it's, and it, it, he, he is a person, but the way I treat him is a character Right. Um, and, and which is, you know, questionable on the ethics of, you know, churning someone into a character. But given his um, prominence, his abundant wealth and yeah. and his and him wanting to be the center of attention with the wonderful world of Disney and everything. Right. It's not I like mean, I'm you're dragging. That, you it's, not, it's not right. It's not like I'm dragging. He he purposefully made himself yeah. a public figure. It's not like I'm dragging some Imagineer you've never heard of out of the shadows and making him a running gag. Like, um, like just making, making his life a joke. Right. And in that case you would be like, yeah, but, but then it's also weird. Cause then you have like Tony Baxter where everyone loves him. Like, I mean, everyone, you know, he's, mm-hmm. he's just so lovable. Like, I think I mentioned, um, to you earlier, one of my favorite lines in the book, um, I, I want to find it cause I don't want to butcher it. Okay. So since we're in spoiler, ter- spoiler territory, there's a line where you mm-hmm. say, most likely sneaking into the headquarters hidden behind the warm whiskers of Tony Baxter's mustache. And I, that is like <laughs> the best sentence and the most, like, I just felt warm and like, to- <laughs> like I had a, like a cup of, you know, like hot chocolate near a fireplace. Cause he's just that, that almost like that Walt Disney, yeah, exactly. you know, I think in a way his persona and how we perceive him is almost how Eisner wanted to be perceived. Um, during his time at the company 
you know, Tony Baxter is just comes across as so passionate and respectful and kind hearted. And so I just love that. That line just made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. I don't know. Tony Baxter is, as you said, such a great, you know, from the outside. I'm sure mm-hmm. he's a great person in his personal life, but he's he does such a great job of upholding such a wholesome right. image and respecting. Like there's, and even when he kind of he's so uh, he does such a great job. I mean, he's also honest. I mean, he he bashes the Lone Ranger at D23, which is hilarious. Um, a hilarious video. Um, but it was just uh, he he does seem like such a great guy and um, very genuine. You know, Tony Baxter is one of. The, Right, Tony Baxter is one of those people that you know what he smells like, even though you've never been in the same room with him. You you, yeah. you can smell what Tony Baxter is, and it smells good. It doesn't smell like fruit, but you know what it you know you know what I'm saying. You know what it smells like. Pick your favorite father figure's cologne right. in your life. That's what Tony Baxter feels like. Um, Unlike Eisner, so, who you know has the exact opposite right. but he, who is your great his your greasy uncle <laughs> but the uh no but uh, <laughs> no i'm uh, i think his problem was that he tried so hard to be um like the next Walt Disney figure that it ultimately backfired on him versus Tony Baxter where he you know i imagine he never tried to like appear as like a Walt Disney figure but you know i think he has more of his essence than um, you know, a lot of people at the company, I would assume. Yeah, and I will say that it did work in a way. I, I will say that his him wanting to be the public face, it worked, I think. It made Disney more personable in the 90s as a brand. It made it feel more accessible versus now this whole corporate machine. I mean, it was always it's always going to be accused of being the worst corporation alive because it's so has its hands in media so much and people don't do research so they don't realize like Comcast is way way bigger um, but because because people are s- simple and they as as a general population people are not as um, inclined to look up stuff easy target is what Disney is um, right and they do deserve some of that criticism but compared to what oil tycoons do you know right and I, and <laughs> not I, as bad and like like don't um, get me wrong but, but, like, I have a lot of nostalgia for growing up and how, like now I have a different perspective because I'm older and I've read more about him and the history. But I remember very vividly being so excited when I would see that, you know, that right. like and then he would come on and I, I'm guilty of having a lot of nostalgia for those as well. It always takes me back like, oh, I remember, you know, being a kid and, you know, being excited to see him on screen because it meant that I was going to get to watch whatever you know Mm -hmm. absolutely and and i but i do think it worked in what he was trying to do now behind the scenes is questionable but again as eisner as a person and we can we should have a longer discussion and so we don't talk we don't take up too much time now it's just so um, easy isn't it come back and talk to it is so easy but he's a but he's a but he is I will give him credit. He has created one of my favorite TV shows, which is BoJack Horseman. So he he, he spent money on that, which was a great investment. So uh, he's redeemed himself in my eyes. I don't even know what that is, to be 100% honest. You don't even know what BoJack Horseman is? I do It's not. an incredible car- cartoon show. It's the most uh, hard look at uh, – not it's slight, some mental illness and just really uh, depression and um, – not just depression, I should mm. say. Just a uh, just the realest characters ever portrayed, I think, in TV, and they're also mm. an- cartoon animals that live in Hollywood. So you get the best of both worlds. You get super serious drama and uh, hilarious comedy about some wacky movie, washed up movie stars that are also horses and cats. Hmm. I'll have to look definitely into that. check it out. And Michael Eisner is the one that uh, paid for it. So yeah, definitely. We'll have to do a like a. Uh, not a debate, but like an Eisner discussion, because there's there's so much more on that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of any. Um, there were. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. There's a few other notes, but it'd be it'd be backtracking too much. So save them for another. Yeah. I'll just say there's a lot of little things in the book that you know I really appreciated because, like I've I've said a few times here. Um, there are certain subjects that I'm like, okay, I do know a lot about that just because I had to do a video on it or whatever. So I love that I was able to take away little nuggets of trivia. And, and again, I, I like that the, uh, the end does kind of take on more of a fictional, like at first I was like, wait, what's going on? And like it, the, the mm-hmm. transition was kind of funny, 
because I was just like, okay, and you know, you're almost like going along for a ride as as it starts. Because at first I was like, wait, the tone's changing, but it was gradual enough to where I, you know, I could go along for it. And then it has a nice <laughs> sombering, you know, message in the end. And um, I, I like that you, you know, try to bring a little humanity to Eisner and to, um, I guess, force or well, not force, but challenge Disney theme park history fans to kind of look at um, aspects of past attractions in a different light or in a different way. Well, thank you. I'm glad that that worked out. So I'm glad that that came through and wasn't, I mean, it's very, it's jarring, but hopefully it's recoverable. I mean, it's jarring, but like once you get it, you're like, okay, like, you know, it, it wasn't, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't right. know how to explain it. You, you, it's almost like being on a ride where you're not sure what's around the corner and maybe it gets really fast, but you just, you enjoy it. You know, it's, um, well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think you've just, you found a really good balance between, uh, topics, demographics, and the length of the book. And I look forward to seeing what you do after this. And in a way, you've actually kind of inspired me because as I've mentioned in the past, you know, I have a few book ideas of my own that I've wanted to do. And sometimes it just takes seeing someone, since, you know, we do similar content creation to make a book, write a book and make it professional. And then it makes people like me go, oh, it can be done. You know, it's doable. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, I mean, when, when I'm looking at people that have done other Disney books, it seems as though they have, they're either focused on that medium alone or, you know, Jim Hill, I, I don't know if he has any books. I know he's talked about one. I, I should actually look at that up. And you no, know, very few of us type of people have done it. Right. YouTube personalities, I should say. So hopefully, um, yeah. So, uh, YouTube personality, especially, but I mean, hopefully, to, hopefully it's, uh, this Indiegogo went well and, well, uh, the book, I should probably plug the book here at the end, right? Yeah, definitely. The, uh, I was gonna, that, uh, that's my, my usual wrap up. So plug, I always say like, right. plug yourself. You know, in this case, plug your book. Yeah. So shameless plug, youtube.com slash defunctland, um, YouTube, twitter.com slash defunctland, facebook.com slash defunctland, reddit.com slash defunctland. You get the idea. Um, you go on all those wonderful websites and whichever your preferred way of uh, engaging in the content is. Uh, is great, and you will find the book when it is available on Amazon. If you did not pre-order it, um, ho- I keep saying that you know you might see it so many times that you're annoyed with it. Um, you're annoyed seeing me be like, buy my book, buy it. So I, I'm not worried about anyone finding it. I just hope that the eventual inevitable of me asking and throwing stuff out there is not too uh, overwhelming. So uh, look, if you follow any of those things, you'll be notified when the book is on Amazon or wherever you'll be able to buy it. So and also. Uh, uh, thanks for having me on the yeah, episode today. Thank you for coming on. Glad we were finally able to do this. And I hope everybody who's been listening and slash or watching has enjoyed this little chat with Kevin from Defunctland. So again, check out his book, and I'll see you all next time in Yesterworld.